join you yet for another Sabbath lesson and we thank God for giving us an opportunity to be with you, to come into your homes or wherever you are watching us from. We thank God that you have joined us this morning. We pray that you will take your lesson discussion book and your Bible so that we can study together this morning. We encourage those who are in the sanctuary to join their classes. Our children classes are outside, so parents ensure your children are in class. So good morning, and this morning I'm joined by my panel. Uh, and before we begin, we, I will ask my sister Renis to pray for us. We are praying. Our Father and our God who art in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful morning that you've allowed us to sit in your presence. As you are going to go through your word, I'm praying that your presence may be with us, that you may give us understanding from above. And above all, O oh God, may you teach us to manage for the master. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Rainis. We are still managing for the master until he comes. And this week, I mean, not just this week, but this lesson, we're in lesson number eight. And as you can see, we have had a very consistent follow-up of what our lesson has looked like. We started by being part of God's family. We cannot manage for the master if we're not part of his family. Then we looked at the different covenants that the Lord has with us. And part of those covenants, we looked at the, co the contract of tithing. We saw that there's so much that the Lord has given us that he has trusted us with as his, his stewards. And so he expects us to return a 10% of everything that is given us, our income and an over increase. We then looked at offerings, free will offerings, that which that you give just because you love God and you are thankful of a love that he's already given us. Then we looked at dealing with debt of that which he's, 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 he's left for us to use. What are you, how are you using it? Are you finding yourself in a situation where you're finding yourself in debt? And why are you in debt? And we looked at practical ways of getting out of debt. We then looked up at laying our treasures up in heaven. How then do we ensure that we're putting together treasure and that treasure is in heaven, that we recognize the importance of knowing that the things of this world will come to an end and there's an importance in laying up our treasures in heaven where we will meet them when we finally make, it, make our way to heaven. Finally, last week, we looked at, at the least of this, my brethren. Are you taking care of the poor among you? Because Jesus said it, and we, we know it, that the poor will always be among us. Are we taking care of the poor among us? Are we being keepers of our brothers and sisters with that which the Lord has entrusted you? Are you taking care of the poor among you? Now today, planning for success. And as I welcome my panelists to introduce themselves, my name is Masi Odor. I will be your moderator this morning. And with me is my panel, starting with our dear elder. Thank you, Sister Masi. Happy to meet you again, my sister Ennis <laughs> and my brother Zongo. Welcome. I'm blessed to be here. Uh, my dear viewers, my name is Jared Manyara. I'm a member of this church and uh, also this year serving as a personal ministry leader and I love serving the Lord. Let's enjoy today as we learn how to plan for success and not failure. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Sister Renis. Praise God. Happy Sabbath. Amen. My name is Renis Onguka and I'm so glad to be here and I love being successful. Amen. Amen. All right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. My my name is Onsongo, Rafael Nyamisoa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel, and uh, I hope I will, we will all uh, emerge from this planning to succeed. Indeed, we are going to emerge out of this having learned how to be successful. So this morning, beloved of God, we looked at the, the word this morning, and I'll, I'll go into our memory verse this morning that's coming from Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. And in our lesson, is summarized using the NKJV version of the Bible. And the word says, and whatever you you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive a reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. And this, we, we, we looked at the lesson and the summary of our, of our lesson on, that, on, on Sunday, and it says most people want to live a successful and happy life, as you have heard Renis and, and Raf really want to be successful, and so do I. Um, of course, in a fallen world, where tragedy and calamity can strike at any moment's notice, the goal might not always be easily attained. This, in spite of our desire to be successful and to live a happy life, and that is what God desires of us, it's not always attainable. Then two, there's the question of how we define success. 
I don't know what my view or how you define success. Do you define success based on the positions that we have? Do you look at the people with the big cars and big houses and look at those ones as successful? I don't know what your definition of success is. And there's a case of someone like Joseph in Egypt. If there was ever a successful life, that certainly would have been one, would it not? From prison to palace. And to think that kind, um, that kind of thing, on the other hand, what about John the Baptist? Would we consider John the Baptist as having been successful? Because from him, it was from prison to the tomb. How successful was his life? Again, it all depends with how you and I define success. This week, we're going to look at the idea of success in the context of basic stewardship. The financial principles, no matter where we are or where we live, money and money and finances are going to be a part of our lives whether we like it or not so what are the practical steps that we can take along the way that even though not guaranteeing a success would protect us to avoid pit common pitfalls and mistakes that may actually make success difficult so as we begin this morning based on that summary and i thank god for our for the writer of this lesson he's a very very practical writer i want to start with you raf in terms of i don't know raf how you define success as a young person uh, because, uh, you know, we, we begin by thinking, like, we go to school. We all have that mindset because no parent would want their children to suffer. But I don't know how you define success as a young person. And how do we look at success in the context of the lesson that we're having this morning? I think um, that's, a very, that's a very philosophical question. <laughs> and uh, I think one, one that many can argue. Uh, as the Bible has, uh, has shown us, like we have the example they've given of Joseph, and of John the Baptist. So who was more successful than the other in this case? The one who becomes prime minister or the one who is beheaded in prison? And so I think success is relative uh, in accordance with what God has called you to do. Um, so you need to find yourself in the context of what God has designed for you to do and um, ask yourself whether you're living up to the potential and to the opportunities that God has availed to you. It may be to be a prophet like John the Baptist, to be true to, your, to, to the word of God, to proclaim it with, without fear and, uh, and, and with boldness. It may be uh, like Jonah to go to Nineveh and not to Tarshish. So, um, and perhaps if you've been called to leadership um, uh, or to, to positional success, there were material success that we can see in terms of um, uh, worldly uh, riches and, uh, and, 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 and materials, then to still be a good steward uh, in, 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 that, um, in, in, in that place where God has put you. So I believe we find our definition of success in terms of what God and where God has called us to be and where, what he expects of us. I like that. I, I like that, uh, Raf, because I think, and, and I've heard many, many times, I, I struggle with this statement of like, they are so blessed. You mm. know, when somebody says that somebody is blessed, Rennies, sometimes they actually are talking about their material possessions. Yes, yes. They look at blessings as material possessions. So when you're defining someone as blessed, you're looking at them because of what you see outwardly. Mm. But I don't know what, Rennies, you think in terms of uh, when we define blessing like that, is that truly blessing? Thanks, Mercy. From what you've said is what even me, I've heard people talk about and say that you are blessed if you are financially stable or if your children are doing well, they are well behaved at home, they are scoring A's in school, we look at you and say, you are blessed. But you see that the blessings of the Lord, according to Proverbs, they say they come and with them they add no sorrow. So it does not, sometimes you might be, it is not that if you have the money you are not blessed. You can have the money and blessed. And also you might not have the money and all these things like fame, a good name, a big car, but you are still blessed. Because in the long run, for me, as Rafa said, is have you lived for God? Because when I look at the patriarchs of old and many people in the Bible, like Jesus when he was dying on the cross, he said it is finished. He was so sure he had lived for why he was, he was called. Same to Paul, he's saying, I finished the race. And when you look at people like Jacob, Abraham, and the prophets, they were, when they were dying, they would gather around their family, and they will be told in the Bible, he rested with their fathers, mm. with their forefathers. So that is success, because by the time they were dying, they were happy that they had lived the life God had called them. And so that's why we are reminded that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be mm. added unto us and also in this life that you are living in 
God in his mercy might make Rennes not to be rich or have so much money for Rennes to be saved because if the Lord would do otherwise, Rennes will be lost for sure. So God in his wisdom, he sees and looks of how to bless me and how to make me successful. Amen. That is so profound, uh, Rennes. Just to think that there are some people who God will allow to be poor in this life that they may be rich in the life to come. Elder. Mm. I have heard, and, and you know, because there's this whole prosperity gospel, and it's real. You know, there's a lot of innocent people out here who truly believe, you know, when their pastors tell them, you know, plant seeds for you, you know, for you to be blessed. That is success. And when you look at the life of Jesus Christ, I don't think Jesus wasn't rich. Jesus actually was born of the poorest of the class. If you think about when they went to dedicate him, they couldn't even afford a lamb. So from that perspective, Elder, how do, you, how do you speak to people out here who really are caught up in that whole prosperity and only genuinely believe that a Christian should not be poor because the Lord says, you know, that he has blessed us. We will be first and not last. Are we last if our children, I don't know, what does that really mean? That we will be first and not last. He will bless us in the city and in the country. What are we missing if we find ourselves not having these material things? Okay, thank you, sister. Uh, before I respond to that, I just want to agree with my fellow panelists that God has a plan even as we plan. Amen. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, most of us count success as prison to palace. Not from prison to tomb. Now, <clears throat> practically, many people have found themselves in the case of John mm. from prison to Tom. Yes, he was a great evangelist. He is the one who preached the message repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Mm. The same message that Jesus preached. Mm -hmm. There are many times. Sometimes you have been promoted at the job, uh, the workplace. You are at the top. Then, when you say you have arrived, you are just sucked. <laughs> or, like now, when uh, like governments and even companies are saying business is not good, they retrench. Mm. You find you are among those people. How do you view that? Is it success? Or failure? What did you plan for? What do you see in the whole scenario? But I want to say that for John, that was great success. One time in my life, I found myself in a situation like John's. From somewhere to nowhere. I remember when I got the message, I just knelt and thanked God it had happened. I told God, now lead me the next phase of what? Life. Of life. Hmm. And I will tell you, <clears throat> that night had a very peaceful night. <laughs> I know many people could not sleep. Hmm. But we want to see that John was in this kind of circumstance. Mm -hmm. But if you remember John sending his disciples to Jesus to ask him if he was the one they were waiting for. Because John's desire was that he hands over to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And once he got that message, he counted himself successful. I don't remember reading anywhere in the Bible where John complained that after doing all this work, mm -hmm. why should I do what? Perish. God, you couldn't have mercy upon me instead of even having me <laughs> beheaded. Why could you just translate me like Elijah <laughs> and take me to heaven? All that happens for the people who love God is success. But I want to thank God that for this lesson, we are going to see what is true success and how to plan for it. Mm. We have the prosperity gospel. 
and everyone thinks that for you to be blessed, you must have a car, you must have a big house, you must have what, you must be where. That is normally the notion that we normally have, which is wrong. Mm. What were the words of Jesus on success? Yeah? <laughs> the Bible is very clear. That, what will it benefit you <laughs> to get what? Gain the, whole world. the whole world and then lose what? Your soul. Your soul. The greatest success for a Christian is not losing your soul. Mm hmm but to save your what? Soul. Your soul. You may be the poorest, but in God's eyes, you are the most successful because you have saved your what? Your soul. Let's remember last week's lesson. Yeah? This young, rich ruler, what did he save? Nothing. <laughs> He acquired the old world, mm. lost his word, lost his soul. So, we may not be the same. And actually, the Bible was clear that the poor will always be among us. Mm. And who are those poor? I could be among them. Mm. <laughs> you could be among them. Mm -hmm. But it does not mean you are not what? You are not successful. Thank you. Elder, thank you. Ralph, let's look at where it all starts. Yeah? So mm -hmm. in terms of looking at first things first. So we've talked about success. And yes, I, I like the definition of success and what we're looking at. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 1, the Bible says that remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come and the years draw nigh when you say, I do not find any pleasure in them. And, and, and what was, what was the, the wisest man that ever lived saying here in terms of where does it all begin? In terms, how do we... How do we begin? So we are planning for success. Our desire is that we should be successful. And God's desire is that we should be successful, mm -hmm. depending on the definition of success as God has said it. Mm -hmm. So where does it all start? Um, I think uh, generally what uh, Solomon is trying to inform us, and I think he's in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, he's approaching it uh, from the perspective of he's advising the younger generation. And he's telling them that the most important thing before everything else, before the materials, is to find ourselves in God, to find our definition in God. And, um, and if we remember our Creator in the days of our youth, then it shall be well for us even as we grow up. As elders rightly put it, uh, sometimes uh, life shakes us as we go along. But if the foundation is right, then we shall, we shall have a good life. I remember, for example, when Paul is closing his... Uh, his um, his ministry, he says he has fought a good fight. He has run a race. He doesn't say, I built this, I bought this car, I built this house. He's, he just says he's, he's done his best and he says, what awaits for me is a crown of glory, which the Lord himself will give me. And so um, we begin with God and hopefully we also end with God. And so um, in, 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 the, in the Sunday part, we are encouraged basically as we are looking to be successful uh, and to, to expand materially or, uh, or in terms of our influence here on earth in whatever position that God has put us or God ex um, uh, exposes us to, that at the end of it all, let's not be carried away uh, with these things, but let us always put God first. Mm. Amen. I like that. And as we look at the story of Jacob, you know, we're looking also at the story of Jacob and looking at how he... He made some important choices. You know, Jacob made some really bad choices. I like the story of Jacob because Jacob, I think, is a full circle of who we all are. Eh? Mm -hmm. Humans are different spectrums. And some of the mistakes that we can make, because this is one guy who made some pretty, pretty ma yes, uh, yes. many mistakes. Mm -hmm. But even in his making mistakes, he made some good choices. You know, mm -hmm. there's some choices that he actually made along the way. So I don't know, Rainis, in your opinion, in terms of just looking at what comes first? As we look at the lesson uh, fr from Jacob and some of the um, decisions that he later makes, you know, when he meets God, as, as Rafa said, the importance of first knowing who you are in the Lord. So spiritually finding yourself, mm. then how does that go in terms of then what are the different steps of going into the other stages of your life as a young person in this life? From the story of Jacob, I like the fact that the lesson writer is saying, and also the Bible says that 
Jacob, the first decision he made was a spiritual decision. Mm. Because when he was lying there and everything was looking upside down, there was no hope, everything looked dead. When that ladder came down, when he woke up, the thing he said, that if you will be with me, mm. then you go with me. You give me bread, you give me food, you take care of me. Then you will be my God. So first he says he will be his God. Then he continues to say, if you provide me with this and this and this, then a tenth of everything you provide, then I will return it. That is a financial decision. And so we see that in this life, for us to be good Christians or good stewardship, we have to make first a spiritual decision. And that is we have to build on the rock. Mm. Then when we build on the rock, then we can be able to stand. And as we look on the life of Jacob, we realize that after making the spiritual and the financial decisions, that's when he decides to marry, which is the next step in his life. And so basically we are advised that before you move to the next step of marrying, make sure that your financial and your spiritual decision is intact. Because basically, even choosing the person you marry is a different financial decision. Because when you marry a person who is a spendthrift and wasteful, it does not matter how much you try to save and make things work. They love to influence the way you do things or the other way around. And so for me in the life of Jacob, I like the way he did things in the right way or in the right steps and not skipping any of it so that in his life he can glorify God. That's very interesting, Elder, because um, we know that the person you marry has a huge, huge impact on what your life is. Actually, Mrs. White says that this is one decision that can, that can dis, dif, sort of determine whether you make it to heaven or not. That's how serious the, this, some of these choices that we are making. But we are being also told, um, we looked at, as we looked at you know, the life choices and, and, and the how, I, I like the practicality of this because we struggle sometimes when you're talking to young people and telling them that a young man ought to at least be able to be financially stable before he takes on a wife and start a family. And sometimes people think we are being, I don't know, we're not being nice. Yeah? When we're saying, Rafi, you need to get a job first. Yeah, yeah. But should we actually, should young people actually be getting jobs? You know, like, should they some form of stability? <laughs> because when we have, uh, I know because sometimes we have to fundraise for weddings. Mm -hmm. We then have to fundraise, I don't know, for what, for dowry elder, you know, as you're taking a young man to, to go pay dowry. I don't know, are we missing something there as a church? And as, uh, so I'm talking to you as an elder, as you're guiding young people, are we missing something there? Are our young people stable and ready to be married, to make some of these decisions that they're making? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, you have cornered me I with know. a very interesting <laughs> question. I know I have, I'm Indeed. sorry. Okay, uh, I've been counseling young people, mm. and let me say, um, now, me and my family, we have cancelled over six couples. Ah, amen. And uh, <clears throat> the very first thing we start with is the spiritual commitment. Because without God, no marriage can survive. Because it is God who unites. Mm. And that's why the Bible says, what God has put together. together. Yeah. First God. Number two, is the financial how are you going to run that home mm. i just want to use the words of one pastor who talked to us when i was a young man and he impacted a sense into my head mm -hmm. he said i know many of you young men say that money is not the issue the issue is love he said that Wives don't eat love, they eat food. Mm. They don't put on love, they put on clothes. <laughs> they don't apply love on their faces to look nice, they apply lotion. Mm. So he said, financial stability is mandatory. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be rich, but at least you must have resources to run that what? That family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elder. I, I like the practicality of this lesson. And this lesson for me has been a very, very practical lesson. And I'm hoping there's some young person who is listening and realizing that there are some choices that you need to make. You know, even the fact that compatibility is important. One of the things that you saw here in the lesson is that 
ask questions. Ask questions before you, before you settle with somebody. Even asking about their level of education. It's not a sign of pride, Elder, to be able to ask. Um, if I'm holding a master's degree, for example, do I really want to marry a girl who has just cleared high school? Am I being a bad Christian if I ask mm. that question? I'm like, will we really be compatible? Because you want this family to be able to stand. And sometimes those are important. They, those are important questions, young people. So ask them and let your parents ask them and don't get upset when we ask those questions. Work. I have teenagers at home. We've always had a value of work. But uh, I woke up one morning and, and uh, ran out of the blues, uh, my then I think he must have been 80 year old or younger. He probably was six. And I told him, you know, we, we had a, 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 a holiday season, December, when we didn't have a housekeeper. And I said, no, this is what you're going to do, your work and your work and your work. And he comes back to me and says, but mommy, I don't do work. I'm done for things. And I said, who does for you things? He says, but auntie does for me things. And he was as innocent as possible. And it was a wake up call for me to the realization that I was raising a generation without realizing that actually did not have value for work. He actually thought people do for him things. So, <laughs> Renis, was work a curse? Is work a curse? Because a lot of young people struggle with, should I be working so hard? Working is so hard. Should we be working? Yes, we should be working and we should love work. Because even we look at the creation story, work did not come after sin. Mm -hmm. But work was there before, before sin. And the Lord says that he, he created male and female, then he, gave, he put them in the garden to till and to tend it. And when you read the spirit of prophecy, it says that this was because without work, man cannot be happy. So you see, God is so much concerned about our happiness that he had to do something to ensure that we are happy. And you see, like in our normal day-to-day -day life, maybe in the way it is our attitude towards work, mm. and especially those people who call themselves that they have gone to school. There are some things, some work, they look at it and they think, this is beneath me. Mm -hmm. But from the word of God, in fact, if you read the spirit of prophecy very well, manual labor is very much encouraged because it, apart from making you happy, it also causes your other body organs to work. It gives you a pride of achievement. It gives you a feeling of having done something good or helped. And we see that work teaches us to do things the right way. And so, just like when we are young, like Mercy is saying, you have to be taught by your parents or your guardians or those people under your care, the value of work. So that as you grow up, you continue doing it, knowing that job is not classified with the level of education, like for me, I can't do this, it's beneath me. But work is for my own good, for my well spiritual being, because as they say, an idle mind and an idle person is the devil's workshop. Mm. So if you have to avoid being influenced by the evil one to do bad things, please get busy and work. Because if you work, very well the whole day. At night you are so tired, you'll just black out and sleep. And you see, even if we look at the commandments of God, like other Adventists, we love talking about the Sabbath. The Bible says you should work for six days. Then on the seventh, you rest. So that means if you rest on the seventh and you didn't work for the six days, then you've broken the commandment mm -hmm. because you should read the commandment in its totality. Wow, Elder, Elder Manyara, I am wondering, so when we talk about God cast the ground, you know, because people tend to actually believe work is a curse, eh? so from that ground, so the, the ground was cast which made work harder. However, so in terms of work and how we should view work, I like what Renis has said about uh, Christians should not be found idle. But we have a lot of idle people, Elder. We have a lot of people <laughs> who... Um, because I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you from a perspective of an older man. You're not that old, but you know what I mean. When you find people who have lost their jobs, because we did talk about losing work, and in this economy, this is happening a lot. So when you have a man who's lost his job, and he's finding it difficult to do work that... He was, he was a manager where he worked. Now you're asking him to go to Marikiti, buy some groceries and come. What's your advice, practical advice, one elder to another? of how he should manage to be able to still take care of, you know, to still work. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sometimes transitions are difficult. Mm. You know, unless you came from there. <clears throat> I, I, I came from manual work. And every time I have an opportunity, I do it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have a problem even if I lost a job now. You will find me pushing a wheelbarrow. And I will do it gladly. But there are some people who are not in that kind of a situation. I, I think at, we need to be a bit sensitive. Eh? Have a discussion. What is it that you can be able to, to do because you must do something. Mm. The Bible is very clear. Second Thessalonians 3.10. If you do not work, Shouldn't it? you should not eat. Mm. And you cannot depend on other people because they also have other responsibilities. Even as we say we help, this list of this, yes. <laughs> the list of this, eh? mm -hmm. we should not help those who are able to do what? To do something. Eh? Mm -hmm. We need to ask them what is it that they can be able to do so that we can also help them to get something that they can be able to do and do it well. Mm. But interestingly, as I looked at the lesson, physical work yes. that God gave us before sin, for our sake, he still retained it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I thank God for that. That he retained the physical work for our sake. And that's why you see, even when people get very sick, one of the things as the doctor gives you medicine, he tells you, also try to do what? Exercise. To exercise. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> In fact, our whole being is work. Mm -hmm. And as my sister brought it out very well, six days, <laughs> you, are, you are only supposed to rest? One. One day. So we need to do a much greater job and that's what we should remind everyone including those who have lost jobs yeah mm. they must be reminded that what god wants us to do is to work mm. to earn that which we eat to earn that which gives us what health thank you very much thank you thank you elder and i like that because i think we need to be we need to be real we need to be real like you said even as we're helping the list of this, my brethren, sincerely, I think we need to encourage people then to also carry their part of that burden. Raph, the Lord looked at, I, I like how this lesson goes in terms of the practicalities of life. And there's, there's a part of your ears, which are actually your earning ears. Because I mean, there's, there's, there's a reason why a retirement age is set. I, you're a medic. I, I know you're a medic. I confuse you and your brother, but I know you're the one who's a medic. And so sometimes you're luckier that you're not bound by just uh, some years of work. But some of us who work in different sectors, then you have, I think, 60 to 65 years of retirement. And a 65-year-old is a very young person. If you're asking them not to come home and just sit at home. But because that's the fact of life, we have earning years. How do we ensure that we are, you know, like we are managing the years that we have you know that window that we have for you to earn and mm. ensure that you're taking care of what the needs that you have too but also you're ensuring that you're, you're 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 watching out for the future so that if you're retiring at 60 or 65 you'll still be able to have something that takes care of you after that so i don't know what your thoughts are in terms of looking at those earning years and how do we ensure that we are we get the best out of those uh. Indeed, uh, it's an interesting uh, question. But before I answer that, uh, so uh, going going back to the initial question that you we, we were answering, I'd like us to consider. I considered uh, Proverbs uh, 24 and verse 27 says, uh, "Prepare your outside work, make it fit for yourself in the field, and afterwards build your house." Going back to the message that you were saying to the youth in terms of. Um, when before even considering uh, settling down, you have to uh, put your spiritual life and even your vocational life in order, uh, the importance of work. And uh, even in those working years, as we are looking at them, uh, I think it calls for wisdom on how to spend your monies and how to invest and uh, also to save for a rainy day because uh, such, such things do happen. Indeed, uh, the lesson writer tells us that uh, for most of us, uh, as you've said, sometimes some could have a vocation or a profession which you can practice 
literally until the time when you when you are tired or for for many of us uh, our vocations have timelines past a particular age even i think legally in the in the, in the even in government there is uh, an age of retirement and so i think um, uh, god calls uh, for us to have the end in mind also we are told even when god was creating uh, adam and eve he knew that they would fall and he had a plan of salvation somewhere at the back so even as we are engaging in our earning years let's not think uh, that we will always be earning let us always remember that the time will come in which we will be uh, asked maybe to put our tools down and to and to go back home and i'd like to go back to what the elder has said also in that um, perhaps we should uh, wish in, sometimes there are dynamics that have happened in our in our world today we have what we call uh, blue collar and white collar jobs and many people are used to sitting in the office and uh, and s sitting on a swinging chair and uh, uh, we have no plans we think we'll be in that office for for long but perhaps we should um, start thinking about maybe retirement homes uh, start thinking about uh, investing even in things like farming something that will will, will engage you far beyond uh, uh, what uh, the official uh, retirement age is such that you shouldn't because uh, for many people there are there are people who get depressed as a result of uh, retiring they don't they have nothing to do they disturb people in the house etc etc you become uh, people are avoiding you when they wake up because they know this one will waste our time here is is idle so i think we need to uh, put it at the back of our minds have a retirement plan if it's uh, personally my plan will be agriculture uh, maybe a farm somewhere you wake up somewhere see your farm engage work with the soil as elder has said and and, and I, I believe it builds character and we transition from one area to the other mm. I like that, uh, Raf. Indeed, it's true. Retirement can be very, very hard. And I don't quite think a lot of us think about it. I think maybe it's because now, I mean, midlife. I mean, that midlife. And I think suddenly, I think 60-year-olds are very young people. There's a time I thought 40-year-olds were very old people. Now I realize just how wrong I was. And 60 is very young. If you have to send me home, then I like that. The practicalities of thinking, beginning with the end in mind, and, and planning planning that that day is coming and the fact that now uh, some of us now um, we probably are eating healthier mm -hmm. so we are living longer and so as you live longer and so sometimes you see people die not because they couldn't have lived longer but because of stress mm. you know because they hadn't planned for these years Renis, I know you're in finance and you you're the people who advise the rest of us as to how to ensure that we are we are thinking with that end in mind I don't know what your thoughts are in terms of practical um, ex uh, advice that you can give to people in terms of how do you plan, how do you save, how do you ensure that you have for today, because you must take your children to school, you mm. know, but also how do you plan to ensure that you're keeping something for a rainy day? Thanks, Marcy. And this part of the lesson is when he's reminding us about what you ask about the cast ground, mm. because now is when you are working to earn out of the sweat of your brow. Because these years, it's also a, a, a short time. Because as you grow old, you don't have that energy that you used to have at that point in time. And also, so basically the principle is this. Do what you are supposed to do, then do what you would like to do. So this is the time to do what you are supposed to do. And you see, this is whereby most of us are trying to keep up with the Joneses. I don't know who the Joneses are, but I believe they are my neighbors. And so if I see Masia has bought a new car, I think I should go and buy a, more, a nicer and a bigger one. Mm -hmm. So that I can look like even me, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm someone. Yeah, I'm making it. But you see, these things are just for a lifetime. And this is when we are called off to have a work-life balance. In this, the earning years, they will not last forever. It's just like in the seven years that Joseph was given and the seven years of plenty and the seven years of scarcity. So the second seven years of plenty are these ones. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if we look at what Joseph was doing and we see the council, you will see like they were supposed like to save a fifth of what they are supposed to do. And so basically me and you in all our earnings, we are supposed to save a fifth. And some of us look at our salary and say that, oh, my salary is so small, it cannot afford this, and no, no. The salary you are earning at any given point in time is enough. Because sometimes if you don't have a job and you're not, it is zero, and you are not dying, and the Lord is sustaining you and you still keep on moving. So whatever you earn, save the bit of it. Because even when you, like those people who work, 
when your salary is increased and you thought like now I would be more rich, I would save all the increase. Shock on you, you spend all of it. Because <laughs> your expenses always is running to catch up or even pass the income. So it is a discipline that you have to have. And in fact, in most organizations, or there are things like the standing orders in the bank or you join the circle or all this, so that the money goes before it hits your account and you start spending like a king. And also another thing that we have to do, we have to be educated as Christians. Because just like we have different personalities, the sanguine, the melancholy, the choleric, and also, we also have personalities when it comes to dealing with money and spending. And so you need to know your personality so that in audit we say you put in the controls that are necessary so that you can be able to achieve that goal that you want to achieve. So basically as a Christian, be educated so that you can make informed decisions. Mm. Yeah. Elder, really, <laughs> these are practical lessons. In this earning years also, Elder, is when we have children. So we have just gotten married. We now are raising our children. And, and there were some practical guidance that this lesson gave us in terms of, you know, um, the goal for a Christian parent is to train their children to become independent adults. So we want to be able to have adults who think like this. Eh? So now, what is it? And to fit them for this life and for the life to come. There are some practical lessons that I don't know. I would want you to just, you know, very quickly look at those three lessons that the, that the writer brought out and any other that you may have in terms of how do we ensure we're doing that, that we are, we are raising a generation that will be independent people. Because you do not want your Ellen to be dependent on you. That beautiful girl, she goes to her marriage and still comes back to your home to ask you for money. I'm not sure that's what you want to raise her to be. Okay, thank you, my sister. <coughs> um, the, the, there's a joke I normally make with my children <coughs> that you know I'm taking care of you so that when I'm old, you take care of me. Okay. Especially when they're very young, they don't understand. They tell me now, when we become big and you are also small like us, <laughs> yeah, then we will take care of you. We'll buy you food will path you, <laughs> will dress you, <laughs> and such kind of things. And uh, it is something I've discovered that in Africa, <clears throat> um, as parents, many times we tell children we want you to be independent, to help yourselves. But we also forget that part of that independent life is also to look at the parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look after the parents. So <clears throat> we need to train the, these people early enough. Uh, from the lesson, <clears throat> there are three lessons that were given. Number one, provide a Christian home environment where children can grow spiritually. Spirituality does not mean devotion, mm -hmm. worship. Uh, alone and even attendance but it also includes tithes and offerings you know there are times we give tithes and offerings as we said earlier and we think we have also done it for the children yeah let's give them I remember someone say that teach even your children to tithe from the money that you give them mm. yeah that is a spiritual environment that you create for the child and sometimes uh, when you do that they start acknowledging who is the creator and who provides the resources that we have then number two we must teach them a willingness to work and an appropriation for it that there is no free lunch as the, uh, as the Englishman says, mm. there's no free word. Lunch. Lunch. Everything they earn, they must work for it. And this is God's requirement for us. Mm. And we even need to remind them and even read for them that verse that says, if you do not work, mm. no what? Right. No eating. I remember those people who grew up in the villages understand this better. You wake up in the morning, you have to work before you go to school. 
if you are just away because of school fees, you get home, the parent tells you get a piece of that uh, jembe. Go to the farm, just weed from there to that point, then you go to school. They were teaching us the value of work. That even that fees that I'm paying for you comes from somewhere. We understood that. Mm -hmm. Although many of us now may not be doing that to our children, but we need to get a way of teaching them the value of work. Then number three, we need to give them a good future. And this good future is through education. And the lesson writer was saying we need to invest in it. Yeah, it's not easy, but mm. we need to invest in it. Because many times uh, we have now children going into certain professions, going to white-collar jobs, and, and even the blue-collar jobs. But they need that what? Education. So we must invest in it mm -hmm. so that they can be able to work and earn something for them to be independent. Sure. So, three steps. One, spiritual environment. Mm -hmm. Take them to work and enable them to get that independent life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elder. And, and yes, as the lesson writer said, there are no guarantees that your children will make the choices you'd hope they'd make. Mm -hmm. So should they make different choices, you would have done your part, which was to teach them. Mm. Working with integrity. Now, integrity, I don't know uh, how we look at integrity. Being trustworthy, being reliable. Can people trust your word? Do you keep your word? And it, when we're looking at the lesson this week, we're looking at the importance of being a kind of person that God looks at now as we do this work. So we have moved from education and our children have entered the working, the working environment. Do they know how to be trusted? Can they be, can they be given a job and someone knows when I have left that job with Renis, I don't have to worry or do they have to follow us? So Raf, Raf, in your opinion, I know you're a good worker. You look like a good worker. So I hope you really are a good worker. What? What is this thing about when you now find something to do, we do it with all your might. And you're doing it unto the Lord. Can your boss attest to your Christianity based on your work, even if they do not know your faith? Can they? And as you talk to us about that, because I want you to talk to young people who are coming to the job market. I, I mean, I'm at the level where we are employing people and you have to interview people, induct them. And I'm surprised at just the level of... Of, I don't even know what to call it, the level of laziness among the young people you're turning out of university, Elder, and I'm, I'm blaming you for it, who come to the workplace, number one, they think they're entitled. Mm -hmm. Number two, they do not want to get tired, and they want to be paid. So, Raph, please talk to my young people who are watching you in terms of the value of integrity. Mm. I think um, the Bible has got examples for us to look at, for example, young people like Daniel, Another example will be Jacob uh, working for Laban. Another example will be even Joseph working with integrity um, in Potiphar's house as a slave, you know, sold by your own brothers. One thing also from the story of Joseph, maybe perhaps, uh, let's, let's linger on the story of Joseph. He, he, he would have sunk and uh, gone into depression and said, he was, after all, he was sold by his own brothers. But wherever he was, he decided he was not going to be a victim. He was going to work. He was going to do his best. So when, in, when he was in prison, he did his best. He was a leader because of his integrity. When he's in Potiphar's house, Potiphar, the Bible records that Potiphar eventually left the running of his house to a young man who is not even an Egyptian, a strange fellow who's come because of, 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 of his character, because of, he was a, man, a person of integrity, one whom he could, he could rely upon. Perhaps even Potiphar didn't know how many, uh, how many cows he had, but he just trusted uh, Joseph. To the extent that even when Potiphar's wife now um, uh, approaches Joseph, Joseph is, we see his integrity once again, not only to God, but also to Potiphar. He says, my master has given me power over everything except you. And uh, be, far and beyond this, he has integrity towards God. And he says, I can't do this thing because it also brings dishonor to, uh, to God. And uh, as you've rightly put it, we live in an age and, an, and a time in which most of us want quick fixes. We want an easy life without going through the process. Uh, we want to get to those high places. And I think there's a time where uh, statistically a poll was taken and it said that uh, most young people were, easy, were okay with engaging in corrupt dealings as long as they're not caught. And uh, that's a sad, uh, sad reality of, 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 of our country today. And perhaps maybe there are examples of people who have, 
who have uh, bent corners and uh, eventually emerged somewhere, more so maybe in the political sphere. sphere. But nonetheless, for us as Christians and as, as godly young people, God expects us to work. In fact, it says the ground was cast for our sake. So let's not be afraid of getting tired. But through these uh, trials, through these temptations, our characters are being refined and uh, God is preparing us uh, for higher and greater duties and responsibilities. Amen. Amen, Raf. I'm wondering, Rainis, in terms of the principles that we're learning from this, from the characters we've looked at, we've looked at Joseph, you know, and, and the Bible actually says, and Potiphar's household was blessed mm. on the account of Joseph. I wonder if our workplaces are blessed on our account. Eh? We look at Daniel, you know, who they knew they could never question his work ethic. There was, though it was unquestionable. We look at actually Jacob, you know, that young man really worked. He was working, he had, um, he had a purpose for which that wife, he must have really loved that woman. <laughs> but he really did work. Even Motivated. after he had both of them, mm. he really did. We find a very hardworking man. I wonder, I wonder, Renis, for you, what principles you're picking from these stories and in terms of working integrity, not just in terms of work, work, but in life in general. How do you live up to be a person of integrity? For you to be a person of integrity, I will say this, what the English people say. Yeah. No one has traveled the road of success without crossing the streets of failure. Mm. Destiny never promised us easy journeys. Mm. It only promised great destinations. Amen. And we see for us to work with integrity and develop these characters, mm. especially now in the workforce, mm. the, as the older generation, we are saying that the young people don't want to work. Mm. But for me, it's that situation in Swahili whereby we say, Puagu hupuata puaguzi. Because now we are the employers. Now we pay minimum wages to ensure that the person does not leave. And mm -hmm. the employee also works minimal work just to ensure that he is not sacked. So it is just this circle of things. And you see, as Christians, we have to go above and beyond that. Because we have a multitude of witness who are watching. And as we started the lesson, we realized that for us to be successful, we have to live for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And so I want to thank God so much for the attitude of Joseph. Because Joseph, even although he was a, a slave and he was not there, he didn't even want to be there, still he worked so hard that the employer could say that this is a good employee. Even Jacob, when he wanted to leave, his uncle Laban begged him and told him, please stay, because he was blessed, because Joseph was there. And you see, those are the things that me and you as Christians, we are expected to develop creative thinking, leadership skills, to be reliable, to give outcomes which are profitable. Because in business, we are in business to make money, not to pass time. Mm. And so when you do these things to employer, that's when the employer is feeling blessed. And for us to get there, it is not by might, it is not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. And that's why me and you as Christians, one thing we have to always remember, everything we do, we should have eternity in perspective. Mm. If we did anything with eternity in perspective, then these values will automatically fall in place. And also, as we were learning on them, years and we are talking about our children we are that generation whereby we are saying that my children will have everything that mm. I did not have and in this whatever we might mean well but you know what we are doing is we are developing incapacitated children who are not capable to live well in this life and most likely they will miss the life to come so each and everything you do have eternity in perspective. Mm. Amen. Ah, Renis, that is so that is so powerful. May someone here starting with me. We're told that, you know, there are so many people there with opinions of how, you know, like how do we achieve success, money management. Okay, Sister Mercy. Yes, before we go to uh, yes. Before we go to that. <clears throat> there's a part that challenged me here on Wednesday. Mm -hmm about working with integrity. Joseph and Jacob, where they work, the owner said, I have been blessed for your sake. Now, 
of our bosses, our organizations, said that the organizations have prospered because we work there? Where you work, where I work, can I see any blessing that has come to the organization because of the way I am working in that particular what? organization? I remember this friend of mine who called me to his office one time. He was a librarian in a government office. And he called me just to ask me about a decision he had made. And the decision was he had ordered for some library books worth 25 million. So the supplier walked into his office with a delivery note. <clears throat> The books have not been delivered, and they told him, uh, I have come so that you sign that you have received this, so that I can be paid, then you can get half, I get half. Mercy, think of 12.5 million. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just sign that someone has supplied, although he has supplied air, <laughs> but you sign that the books have been what? Have been received. Supplied. Then uh, he looked at him and asked him, now, how do I sign and I've not received books? The supplier tells him, but that's what we have been doing with your former colleagues. Yes. He said, now, I think it may not work with me. Because I, I really could prefer to see books in this library. And I tell you, <coughs> that the man went back disappointed. So he called me to ask me, did I make a, a right decision by refusing 12.5 million? Mm. I asked him one question. <clears throat> what do you think of the decision you made? He told me I can be able to see a, a, a well-equipped what? Library. Library. So for him, his integrity had blessed the organization with an equipped what? Amen. Uh, an equipped Amen. library. Thank mm. you, Elder. Thank, Thank you. you. As we look at um, how do we seek godly counsel, because we are told there are many, many people who we can go to for, for guidance. There are many people we can go for guidance, and I know we are running out of time. But, the, but, the, but um, Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 and 3 is, is, is a verse that I love to read to my children. Blessed is the man who, knocks, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinner, nor sits in the, in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaves also not wither, and whatever he does prospers. Today we are talking about success, my brothers. And I'll, pick, I'll, I'll leave this to you, Raf, very quickly, to look at the importance of seeking godly counsel. You know, in, in, even as we really want to be successful, how do we seek God's counsel? Who do we go to for counsel? Let's start there. Mm. I believe, yeah, uh, many uh, have suffered uh, in this uh, in the economic uh, in the economic market mm. because, especially, like there are things like Bitcoin. There are many things mm. that come up that offer very quick uh, returns, and sometimes we find Christians rushing there, uh, investing in certain uh, th things here and there all in the aim of uh, with the promise of making a quick buck mm -hmm. but the bible tells us to slow down and uh, there's a way in which god uh, has uh, has through scripture given us uh, steps and principles that uh, that we can follow that we should be able to this is where i also believe the 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 advantage of fellowship having uh, uh, like for example elder your friend called you see that's an example of uh, fellowship in a in a godly community where you have um, peers and elders whom you can ask uh, who are experts in, 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 in the markets and, uh, and in, in various areas and investments. And so I believe we should leverage on, uh, as Christians in identifying other godly men and women who are following biblical principles and that are also, actually also uh, making a difference uh, at the workplaces and in the marketplaces. And so it is, it is important to seek godly counsel because where godly counsel is then uh, for a fact, success follows. It is guaranteed. Uh, but where there is no vision, because God is not there, we are told uh, people perish. Uh, people perish. So it is important. It is very pivotal to seek godly counsel from godly men and women. Amen. Mm. Renis, 
I don't know. I, I know we, we, we had we had a, like a run through of some of the practical steps that we should do so that as, as we seek godly counsel. I don't know if you can take us through those very, very quickly, even as we come to the end of our lesson. So there are godly steps which the lesson is giving us, and there are seven. So one of them is get organized. Mm -hmm. So financially, basically, what they are telling you, do a budget. Don't just have ideas in your head and go implementing them. That's why when you get into any shop, you just start buying things because, it was, and because you didn't prepare a budget. When you do one, you get organized. Then spend less than you earn. That is the only way that you will keep away from being covetous. Always spend less than you earn. Live according to your budget. Cut your coat. Cut your dress according to your coat. And then number three is save. And that's why you are reminded of the ant and you are told, consider the ant. Mm -hmm. The ant works so hard, even if you try to block them, you try doing what, nothing happening. Mm -hmm. Because they know that winter is coming. As we are also supposed to be conscious of the seasons, just like the ant. Mm -hmm. So that the winter, which is the old days when it comes, will be prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Then avoid death, like COVID-19. <laughs> Yes, avoid debt. And I think two weeks ago, we were given enough counsel on that. Mm -hmm. Then be a diligent worker. That is what we've been reminded in this week. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Then be financially faithful with God. Mm -hmm. Because if you are robbing God, then it will not work. Mm -hmm. Because you are just attracting curses. Yes. So put first things first. Mm -hmm. Then remember that this earth is not our real home. Yes. That's why everything you do have eternity in perspective. Amen, amen. Our dear viewers, we have come to the end of our lesson. It feels like this, this, the time is never enough, but it really it is. We want to thank God this morning as we looked at the importance of planning for success. And we can't be successful because God has given us an opportunity to do that. The book of Proverbs chapter 3 from verse 5 to 8 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. When all is said and done, let God be your guidance. Let, let God be your guidance. Let him be the one to show you where to go and how to go about it. So dear viewers, may the Lord bless you as you plan for success. Next week we look at beware of covetousness and why do we end up wanting to have what my neighbor has. So until then, may the Lord bless you. Elder, if you could pray for us as we close. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your mercies upon us. <clears throat> thank you for revealing to us this morning on how we can plan for success. Lord, we know it's not possible on our own, but we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives and how we invoke his presence in our lives. Lord, you have taught us the principles and Lord, help us every day to review them as we go through your word. We want to thank you for leading us through this lesson discussion as we served. And Lord, we want to pray for all those who shall be serving in the course of the day until we come to the end of the Sabbath. We also commit the programs of the day unto you, that Lord, you lead us for this humble prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.